So this is a song by a Lebanese composer, a contemporary composer, uh, who was at school with my main teacher, Salam Khir, who came from the village next to where Khalid Ibrahim came from. And um, which is most of them turned into a museum, I think. And it's a setting of a poem by a very interesting... What was that? <laughs> setting of a, a very interesting Sufi poet who um, managed to um, do what is the aim of every spiritual path, really, clear himself of his lower ego and channel the divine presence. And he was obviously executed for it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what happens, apparently. Um, so he was actually crucified in Baghdad. Oh, really? You know I'm talking about. But he's, he was such a phenomenal scholar and uh, mystic that even Rumi, sort of uh, uh, prompted by his teacher, Shams Tabrizi, um, always bowed down to him. I mean, he was one of these mysterious figures in Islamic history who managed to gain such nearness to the divine that um, he practically fell off the planet. So this uh, is obviously, the poem is obviously practically impossible to translate. Um, but it's basically about divine love. And the punchline is this. Um, my soul is his soul, and his soul is my soul. My will is his will, and his will is my will. But in the process we go through all this beautiful imagery about gazelles, and um, which is normal for Arabic poetry. <laughs>
of the song there, as you probably noticed. <laughs> that um, the thing they have in common is that they're both in classical Arabic, and they both there's mention of um, the wind and the breeze again, which is also I mean there's a, there's a similar word for love actually in Arabic language. Um, and this one is actually homegrown. This is by a Palestinian poet and composer from Nablus called Israel Tupan, and who was. Um, I, I know some of his family is from Virginia. beautiful medieval carol, which is anonymous, as a lot of medieval carols are, and it's traditionally played on the lute, and as this is an ancestor of the lute, his grandfather, or it's a grandfather of the guitar, uh, the lute, it's, I mean, it's probably his dad, um, so it's kind of, it's, it's quite easy to play lute music on the oud, except it doesn't have frets, so you have to, um, the chords are a little bit tricky. I'll do my best, and it's about the birth of Jesus, who is obviously one of the most important prophets in Islam, um, and apart from Jews for Jesus, the Jews haven't recognised him yet, but um, maybe when he comes back. <laughs> so, um, it's, I was contemplating this idea of the incarnation of the divine at Christmas, obviously my family are, are Christian, and I was listening to Mozart's Et Incarnatus Est, which is just gorgeous from his C minor mass, um, and just thinking, well, yeah. And also Bach's Matthew Passion, uh, um, not Matthew Passion, Christmas Oratory, rather. Um, and I was pondering this idea that the infinitely vast divine creator of the universe could incarnate as a small child. And you know, like he says in the, in the base aria in the Christmas Oratory, that um, he who created heaven and earth has to sleep in a hard crib. So that's the story. And of course, this is very problematic for very Jewish and Muslim people because we basically don't believe in, in uh, we don't believe that he was the son of God. And he never said that he was the son of God anywhere in the, the um, in anywhere in the Gospels. He called himself the son of man. Um, but it's an interesting idea that the divine spirit, or the Holy Spirit, can incarnate into a small human being. And I think it's kind of, for me, it's kind of symbolic uh, of God being at the centre of everything. So that, that he's infinitely far, but infinitely close. In the Qur'an it says that God is, is closer to us than our own hearts or our own jugular veins. Um, but at the same time he is infinitely massive and encompasses everything. And so there's nothing outside of his presence or his awareness, because he's obviously all aware. Uh, but at the same time, he is so close that we can talk to him and, and he can actually be, or his essence in some way can be contained in a small human body or any of, of his creation. We can only see evidence of him through his creation because of our limited sight. So, um, yeah, it's an idea that I've been philosophising on. <laughs> it is kind of a philosophical problem, in a way. Um, the, the kind of microcosm microcosm, macrocosm of uh, man and the universe. So here it is, up there we go.
know, I mean, the Christians basically, I had a conversation with a nun in, in the, the um, Latin church in Ramonda, actually, on, um, on the eve of, of the Orthodox Easter, um, where they had a big uh, service. And I went there to hear one of my former students, uh, who I used to teach in the music school there, singing in the choir. Um, and so, obviously, this nun saw me walking into the church as the only hijabi in the building and wanted to know what was going on. And asked if I was Christian, I said, well, my family is Christian, is that good enough? And she said, well, you have to be Christian to take part. Um, so I carried on reading along with the service as she got called away into the vestry. And then she came back and asked me um, uh, if, uh, she said that some people might be worried that I'm a terrorist and could she please check my bag? So I said, yeah, fine, yeah, you can check it, it's just mostly chaos. Um, but I thought, wow, I mean, Islamophobic propaganda has reached um, churches in Palestine, it's a bit sad. Um, but um, I did have a conversation with them afterwards, with another nun as well, who interestingly said that Jesus was the last prophet. And I thought, okay, I'm hearing this from a Christian nun, that he was a prophet. And he's usually referred to as either as divine, as son of God, or even as God. So I thought, well, there's progress. Um, but... Um, so... Um, of course, Muslims, we Muslims believe that Muhammad was the last prophet. And so, um, uh, whenever you, you guys are ready to accept the last two prophets, there are some words that you can repeat after me, I'm joking. Um, so, this is kind of a similar song, but it's from Muhammad. And he's known as Habibullah, the, the beloved of God. Um, whereas Jesus is known, known as Ruhullah, Ruhullah, which is spirit of God, which is, it kind of refers to the fact that um, he was um, in a, he was able to perform miracles due to the divine presence and the spirit of God being with him. That's what's written in the Quran and several places that that the Holy Spirit was with him, and so he was distinguished from the other prophets by that. I mean, they all have a, a distinction: Moses, Jonah. They all have a, a kind of specialization, of course, uh, Abraham, obviously. Um, so this is the this is the Muslim version. And it says that from the brightness of your face, um, the moon was created, which is a very kind of Arabic, poetic way of describing the beauty. <laughs> ya Habib, Ya Habib, Ya Habib, Ya Habib.
So we're just going to do a few minutes and then we'd love to hear you and thank you. <clears throat> so we'd just like to sing one more song which comes from the Psalms. And I lift up my eyes unto the mountains. From where? Is it from whence or from where? Uh, from whence does my heart come? <clears throat> from where does my heart come? And then um, I think it's where. Yes, well, yes. Right, let's look at my heart. So this, these are very beautiful words that, um, in time of challenge, one can draw on them. And then I would like to finish our. Um, um, what we're doing with a few words um, also about hope and faith and time of challenge. We'll sing it in Hebrew and in English. of the Red Sea. So what happened? The crossing of the Red Sea, Pharaoh let the Jews, let the Israelites out of Egypt. And then he changed his mind. And you ha we have to understand that the, is that the Egyptians had gone through tremendous trauma, you know, all those ten plagues culminating in so many families losing their menfolk there. Fathers, husbands, sons. It must have been absolutely horrendous. Pharaoh changes his mind, and the Israelites are on their way in the desert to the Red Sea, and the Egyptian chariots and horses are coming after them. And so they were literally, we have an expression in English, you're between the devil and the deep blue sea. That's an English expression. Here they were between the Egyptians and the Red Sea. And one man, called Nachshon, the son of Aminadav, he was married to Aaron's sister, if I'm not mistaken. Nachshon, he just walked into the sea. And the Jewish oral teachings tell
tell us, this is not in the text, but in the oral teachings, tell us that he walked up to his nostrils into the sea. And this nun, who I have to find her name again, because she did me a great favour, she explained how a story can really impact on your consciousness. And when I read how she embellished the story, I realized that if I can draw on Nakshon's energy, then I can really get through a lot of challenges in life. And we all have challenges. I have a particularly challenging person in my family. And when he calls me, Sometimes I just say, oh, hi, and my whole body like falls. But when I remember Nachshon, then I stand straight and my shoulders are back and I try and call it my Nachshon energy and I talk to this difficult person and my whole attitude to him and to me and to my life changes. It helps me so much and I want to leave that with you because, because it helps me and I know after I've told this, um, this little story, people have come up to me in London, I told it, and this man came up to me and said, you've given me the courage to go to the hospital and deal with something on behalf of my wife that I need to do and I've been putting off but this has given me that extra bit of courage. And so I'd like to leave this with you, that in times of challenge, we are in a time of challenge nationally, internationally, and also all of us individually. I know that we go through times of difficulty. I encourage you to draw on that natural energy and keep going forward. And now, I want to thank... Ida, thank you very much. Julia, thank you very much. And, but we have our, our own Mohammed who's come and he, he plays it Ud beautifully and you just about made it in time. Um, and so we'd love to hear you and thank you Mohammed for coming. Mohammed um, regularly plays the Ud at a meeting called Praying together in Jerusalem, which happens once a month in Jerusalem. So, this is a, an Interfaith Encounter Association event with the Huda Stola. And thank you for putting, the, putting this together with me. And um, the people who are interested in interfaith events, so please let us know, and we'll put you on on the um, 